Karai Origins. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Terry and this is Marvelous Videos. There aren't a lot of fighters in New York City that can kick Leonardo, Donatello, Michelangelo and Raphael's shells all over the place, but unfortunately for the Turtles, this femme fatale is one of them. Oroku Karai didn't appear in the very first incarnation of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated series because she didn't exist when the show began. She was introduced in Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird's comic book series Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in 1992 when the title was still under Mirage Comics. But apart from that one series, Karai has been a part of nearly every other piece of media related to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise, and with good reason. Her compelling backstory, unshakable personal code, and conflated yet conflicting loyalties make her one of the most interesting characters that has ever existed in the Turtleverse. But what exactly is that story? What is her code? And why are her loyalties conflicted in the first place? We're going to explore all of that and more. This is Karai's Origins Explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to the channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Now let's begin. An enigma at the start. Karai in Mirage's original TMNT series. Karai was created four years before the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon stopped airing for good, which means that they could have introduced her in later seasons but chose not to, and perhaps that's for the best. Because by 1992, that animated show had become its own thing, and introducing Karai would make zero sense to the story anyway. We know that she would have ended up becoming the residential femme fatale of the series, because the character's creator specifically named her Karai, which means hot or spicy in Japanese. But there were already a ton of other compelling female supervillains in that show to begin with. Too many cooks do end up spoiling the broth, and even if they had introduced her to the series, they couldn't have done much with her because, well, Karai was created partially to try and fill in a power vacuum, and Shredder pretty much never loses his power in the original cartoon. He shares it with Krang, of course, but he himself is never out of the picture for too long, which is more than we can say for the original comics because the reason why Karai entered the Turtleverse was to tie up the loose ends left dangling in the wake of the Foot Clan leader's death. Karai shows up in New York City all the way from Japan, not for a slice of pizza, but to quell the civil strife that has engulfed her organization. After Leonardo kills Shredder, the American faction of the Foot Clan falls into complete disarray. Foot soldiers splinter off pun very much intended, from each other, and begin a civil war that leave the Big Apple looking like it just came out of a wildfire. And to make matters worse, Shredder's elites are killing anyone they can get their hands on, including their own underlings. Amidst the ensuing chaos, the Turtles grapple with whether they should get involved with the war or not, when their shells are nabbed by none other than Miss Karai, foot ninja extraordinaire and the leader of the Japanese faction of the clan, that is, the original organization. Karai enters New York looking to reunite the splintered, there it is again, foot clan factions under her own rule, but ends up embarking on a quest for vengeance against the elites, who end up killing her only daughter in their mindless task of, quote, avenging the fall of their master. Karai had already convinced the Turtles to join her in containing the rogue Foot Clan members, but her motives now shifted towards killing the Foot Elite, with Leonardo agreeing to help her ease her loss by partaking in the vengeance. But by the time Karai and the Turtles were done with the Foot Elites, they had earned each other's respect and Karai decided to honour the vow she gave to Leonardo when they first discussed the team-up. The Turtles help her create order from chaos, and she calls off the Foot Clan's vendetta with them for good. Both sides leave the City at War storyline having kept their words, and Karai wouldn't resurface until Volume 4, where she seemingly seduces a down bad Casey, and also seems to have conceived a child with him. Oh, and she re-enters the story with a rather badass new look, being pursued by alien ninjas, allegedly, and rekindling her honourable acquaintance with Leonardo. But, because the series came to an end shortly after the whole Casey Karai one night stand situation, we never officially get to see what happens next, which is what makes the 2003 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated series such a blessing. About time you showed up! The adopted daughter of Shredder, Karai's first proper origin story. Karai made her debut in the 2003 reboot of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated series during Season 2. Much of her introduction to the story remains the same in the comics. She arrives in New York after finding out Shredder is dead, and attempts to bring order to the chaos that has ensued in his wake. The major difference, however, is that in the show, the City at War arc has not one but three rival factions vying for power in New York City. 
The first is the Foot Clan that's trying to maintain its grasp on the city's underworld. The second is the Mafia, which has aligned itself with the evil scientist Baxter Stockman and is trying to re-establish its historic foothold in the Big Apple. And the third is the Purple Dragon, which itself is undergoing a leadership crisis as one of their leaders also happens to be a Shredder disciple. Amongst all this are the Turtles, who end up intervening in the Civil War mostly thanks to Leonardo, who feels completely responsible for the things that are happening in New York, and manages to compel his brothers, even Raphael, with his sheer determination to do the right thing. And just to make things even more complicated, in comes Karai with her Code of Bushido, her tragic origin story, and an offer for the Turtles. It's revealed in season Season 2 episode 16 that Karai grew up in extremely harsh conditions. Her parents, who were too absorbed in their own lives and vices to look after someone else, abandoned her at an orphanage. She spent much of her early formative years lonely and frustrated at having been abandoned, until one day she was adopted by the Utron we know today as Oroku Saki aka Shredder. He noticed the burning determination in her eyes and decided to take her in as his own daughter, bestowing her with the Oroku title and personally training her in the art of ninjutsu. Karai grew up to be one of Shredder's most loyal and lethal devotees, trusted enough to be given the real secret of Shredder's identity, while at the same time retaining that human father-daughter relationship with him. But while Karai was unflinchingly loyal to the Foot Clan, she was also a devout Bushido practitioner and believed in conducting her affairs with honor. Honor. She would not kill for killing's sake, and often goes out of her way to spare warriors who have fought bravely. Karai rose to become Shredder's second in command, and was given the charge of the Japanese branch of the Foot Clan, until she entered the United States to help sort out the American faction. Karai enters the City at War arc with a proposition for the Turtles. They will team up and take out all rival factions to consolidate the city's underworld under the clan and end the chaos, and the Foot will call a truce with the Turtles, giving up on revenge. Over the course of three episodes, Karai managed to convince Leonardo to help her, and they came to an understanding where both of them recognized each other's Bushido and honored their ends of the bargain. But at the end of that episode, it was revealed that Karai was secretly nursing Shredder back to health, and although she was loyal to her warrior's way, if push came to shove, she would pick her father nine times out of ten. Season 3 explored those rare occurrences where Karai would defy her father because she spent that entire season feeling conflicted about where her true loyalties lay. On the one hand, she wanted to help her father because without him she would most likely be dead. But on the other hand, the Turtles and Master Splinter were right when it came to things she cared about, like honor and the warrior's way, etc. So something had to give for Karai to make a decision, and it did in the season finale, where she sided with Shredder after Leonardo refused to give up on his own quest. Up until this point, she'd refused to strike him seriously given their mutual respect for each other. But after Leo's actions got Shredder exiled by the Utroms hiding on Earth, she decided that the Turtles had betrayed her trust instead. Donning her father's mantle, she takes control of the Foot Clan and proceeds to make the Turtle Brothers' lives miserable throughout seasons 4 and 5. During her time as Lady Shredder, Karai has yet another showdown with Leonardo, but she is soundly defeated with Leo menacingly warning her to stay away from his family. Her character arc gets all sorts of confusing towards the final stretches of this story, however, as it's revealed that Oroku Saki's Shredder gimmick was actually inspired by an ancient Tengu demon, and Karai somehow ends up becoming telepathically linked to him, which is what the Turtles rely on to defeat him in the end. She also falls for her second-in-command, Dr. Chaplin, and it's implied that they themselves have settled with each other in the series finale, where Casey and April end up getting married. Oh, and Karai also serves as the linchpin for the events of the Super Meta 2009 animated film Turtles Forever, which saw the Mirage Comics Turtles, the 1987 Turtles, and the 2003 Turtles cross over in an event that could have literally ended all of their continuities. Thanks to Karai now fully turning on Shredder, the Turtles, Splinters, and the rest of the gang managed to save the time-space continuum of the TMNT franchise, living to get rebooted another year. And that year would be 2012, where we would get an entirely new backstory for Karai, one that's somehow more bizarre than what we've told you so far. But now I'm turning the training over to someone new. Mischief Maker, Expert Kunoichi, and Splinter's Daughter? Karai in the 2012 TMNT animated series. The 2012 TMNT reboot took a look at the Mirage source material, gave a nod to the IDW comics material, which we'll get to, and said, 
Nah, I'm doing my own thing. In this version of the series, Karai is still the second in command for Shredder, and she is still operating as his daughter for most of her initial appearances. But the tone of the character and her relationships with the Turtles are drastically different from anything we've seen from her so far. Voice actress Kelly Hu revealed that she had not seen any of Karai's portrayals prior to lending her vocal cords to the character, which turned out to be a positive, as 2012 reboot Karai is nothing like her previous incarnations. Playful, deceitful, and way more dishonest than the Bushido-loving warrior woman from the 2003 adaptation, you could describe Karai's personality as being akin to Catwoman's, and in keeping with that analogy, Leonardo is her proverbial Batman, as their relationship is very reminiscent of that flirtatious rivalry. Karai is also related to Master Splinter in the most mind-boggling way, in that she was his actual biological daughter before he became a massive man-rat. See, Splinter in this iteration of his character is a reincarnation of Hamato Yoshi, the man who struggled with Iroku over his beloved Tang Shen. Yoshi had a daughter with Tang Shen whom he named Miwa, but when Shredder killed his wife, he also took his daughter hostage. Fifteen years later, after Yoshi is, quote, reborn and charged with raising four youthful turtle men as his wards, his daughter comes into contact with Leonardo, thereby establishing a link between her and the turtles. In the beginning, Karai sides with Shredder over the turtles as she truly believes him to be her father, but after he brings in Tiger Claw to replace her, and after Leonardo tells her the truth about her parentage, she begins to doubt herself for the first time in her life and goes directly to Splinter for an answer. There, her worst fears are confirmed that Splinter was in fact her real father and that she had been trying to kill him at the orders of her father's worst enemy. Karai develops an intense hatred for Shredder following this revelation and even tries to go off to kill him herself, but Leo manages to calm her down enough to get her to call it off. All this is to no avail, sadly, because she ends up getting abducted by Shredder, injected with a mutagen that turns her into an anthropomorphic snake, and brainwashed into becoming Shredder's daughter again. Leonardo has a brutal death match against Snake Karai, and it's also revealed that she was slowly losing herself to her predatory instincts. If it hadn't been for the love that she had for her real father, Splinter, and Donatello's retro mutagen, she would have been a very angry snake lady, driven mad by a homicidal instinct to devour her so-called father, Shredder, and possibly a rat or two. Karai is then forced to watch her dad get bodied by Super Shredder, and goes through a bit of a dark spell when she recruits a dark sorceress called Shinigami, which is literally Japanese for, quote, God stroke goddess of death, and makes her own foot clan to take out Shredders. But disaster strikes when it's revealed that Shredder has transformed himself into the very thing that he hates, a mutant. With his newfound power, Shredder and Master Splinter have one last battle to the death, with Shredder coming out on top. But his moment in the sun is short-lived, as he's defeated by Karai in the aftermath, with his taunts about killing her the same way he killed her mother being thrown back in his face when Karai stabs his mutagen-filled heart. But Tiger Claw manages to save Shredder, and he returns in his final boss transformation as Super Shredder. Super Shredder attacks the Turtles and his former daughter, nearly killing the latter, but the good guys are able to turn the tables on their longtime rival, and Karai finally avenges her parents' deaths. After this, she joins the Turtles and continues fighting on the side of the good guys, eventually starting a relationship with Leo, hashtag Leo Rai for life, and the femme fatale turns into the most adorable, hyper-energetic and lethal anti-hero that TMNT has ever seen. Which is a great thing, because IDW decided to give Karai a family history that was darker and definitely weirder than anything the show could have come up with. Karai is a demigoddess? IDW comics version of Karai. So, in the IDW reboot of the TMNT comics, man, the Turtles have had a few publication houses go through their origins, right? Karai is given a family history that is far more intimately tied into the legend of the Shredder, the Foot Clan, and the Turtle vs. Gods, because technically, TECHNICALLY, Karai is a demi-goddess. Well, a descendant of a demi-goddess, but let's explain. In the IDW comics iteration of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Foot Clan is but the means by which the youngest member of their divine pantheon plans to resurrect their great matriarch. Called Kitsune, this goddess influenced Tatsuo Takeshi, the founder of the Foot Clan, into doing her bidding, and would later exert her influence over Oroku Saki as well. And why would she do that? Well, to resurrect her father, the great dragon, into a human vessel she called a dragon warrior, which was to be Oroku Saki, and then put an end to all humanity. So, you know, typical god stuff, I suppose. Anyway, Takeshi was just the first step in preparing for the dragon's return, because Kitsune went a step further and actually 
became intimate with Oroku Saki, bearing his children as the family matriarch some 300 years before the current timeline. And in issue 5 of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles micro series, we're told that Karai is the daughter of Oroku Yori, which proves our claim that Karai is a demigoddess in this iteration of her character. But now we have that particular victory lap out the way, let's explore Karai's origins from this version of her character because it's fascinating to say the least. By the time Karai came kicking and crying into the world, the Foot Clan had become completely different from what it originally was. Her father had replaced their ninjas and assassins with businessmen and lawyers, turning the foot into a corporation. While this did make them wealthy and influential in their own clandestine manner, it was way different from the time when they could influence society simply by executing someone. And she realized that her father was a hypocrite for asking her to draw strength from the clan when he himself had made it impotent. And a coward besides, because he allowed one of his subordinates, Nakamura, to disrespect him openly and simply resorted to money to solve the matter, instead of doing things the quote, right way. So, when her mother caught her eavesdropping on the conversation and banished her to the library, the ever-inquisitive Karai came across the legendary book that contains all the secrets of the Foot Clan and began training herself to become a proper ninja. For a while, she led a dual life, spending her morning hours posing as the ideal Japanese upper-class girl and using her her night hours to train to the brink of insanity. In fact, she must have gone insane because one night, her 300-year-old ancestor, Oroku Saki, visited her in her dream and casually asked her to resurrect him and hand over control of the clan. When Karai called him out for his BS, he cut her palm and proved that, at the very least, she wasn't dreaming and he could be a ghost. But ghost or no ghost, you have to admit that a spirit keeping an eye on their descendants' fighting stance from the netherworld is sort of creepy. And Karai would come to realize this herself, though not for many more years. After communing with Saki, she resolved to restore the Foot Clan to their old ways and exacts vengeance on Nakamura for disrespecting her father, who dies a few weeks later because of the stress introduced by Nakamura's death and his subsequent failure of managing the Foot's assets. Once she has restored the Foot Clan to its traditional modus operandi, she uses her blood to resurrect Oroku Saki as promised and hands over control to him, taking her place as his second in command. But the Shredder never seems to be pleased with Karai as he constantly derides and her for her actions and decisions. He even goes so far as to have Leonardo captured and brainwashed just to replace Karai as his tune-in, and then reveal that it was all just a test to see how far she was willing to go to earn Shredder's respect. He restores her to her rank after the Turtles make away with their brother in tow. When the Shredder is presumed dead on Burnout Island, Karai takes control of the clan and she remains a prominent tempering influence, actively deriding Shredder's involvement with Baxter Stockman and other such dishonorable folk. Her code of honor is so strong that she leads her personal faction to take out drones commissioned by Shredder to kill the Turtles and Splinter just so she could give them quote, warrior's deaths. This ends up backfiring on her grandpa big time because Splinter manages to kill Shredder after running through a life or death gauntlet and, surprisingly enough, becomes the new leader of the Foot Clan. We didn't see it coming either. From here, Karai returns to Japan where she somehow ends up becoming the most influential Yakuza member and returns to the story for its final major arc that sees Kitsune manipulate her and a resurrected Oroku Saki into bringing the dragon back to life. Karai is saved by the efforts of Leonardo and Master Splinter, with the latter sacrificing himself to contain the force of destruction that was the dragon. Talk about a grand makeover, but that's just the story of Karai. Can she back it up with her skills? And, well, spoiler alert, yes she can, guys. What makes Karai such a formidable opponent? Karai is hands down one of the best fighters in the Turtleverse. She is extremely proficient in all 18 disciplines of ninjutsu and has jonin level combat skills, evident by the fact that she becomes the leader of the Foot Clan in some capacity across all her incarnations. Her fighting skills are so good that she can take on Leonardo, the best swordsman of the Turtles, with no added pressure. In the IDW comics, after Shredder brainwashes Leo, they have a fight where Leo comes out on top, but it's later revealed that Karai let him win because she was more concerned with what Shredder might do to her if she killed his personally selected Chunin. In the 2012 animated series, she's shown to be capable enough to take on all four Turtle Brothers without breaking a sweat, 
and if that doesn't tell you all you need to know about her fighting stats, then I don't know what else to tell you. Oh wait, we haven't spoken about her mutant form yet. So in the same 2012 animated series, Shredder injects Karai with mutagen that contains the DNA of snakes, the natural predator of rats, and transforms her into a mutant. After she gains control of her faculties and learns how to morph into a snake and back into a human being, Karai becomes one of the most feared and lethal fighters of the entire franchise. She gains superhuman speed, strength, reflexes, agility, and endurance. She also regains a regenerative factor that works basically like that of a snake, where she can shed her skin to instantly heal major injuries like burn wounds. She also gains all the requisite abilities of the venomous reptile, being able to generate a vast array of complex and potent poisons that can only be cured with a literal prayer attack. She can also hypnotize her targets with her eyes, like a snake, and can even grow an appendage with a second face, increasing her range of attack and defense. Basically think Orochimaru, but female and without the immortality, though Karai does age much slower than regular folks thanks to her mutant genes. Karai is by far one of the strongest mutants the franchise has ever come up with, and you would not like to cross paths with her in her feral state. Neither would I, to be honest, so let's just move on to our conclusion, shall we? Marvelous Verdict Karai is going to go down as one of the most iconic cartoon characters of all time. From the moment she's introduced to the story, she is treated like a big deal, and that remains consistent, something we sadly can't say for too many female leads in animated media. She's formidable and definitely in the service of evil, but isn't inherently evil herself, which makes her the emotional anchor of the story for us. Yes, our turtle brothers will always be the core of our love, but Karai is that niche personality that draws you in with her overwhelming presence. Whether it's it's the version that's a strict practitioner of Bushido, or the one that would like nothing more than an evening fighting and flirting with Leo, each incarnation of Karai is just as gripping as the last one, if not more, and the way her character keeps evolving without losing its gravitas is what makes her our favourite TMNT character that isn't named after a renaissance artist or a thing that happens to wood if you expose it to harsh weather conditions. That and the fact that she is just as spicy as her name suggests her to be. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one. Thanks for watching and see you next time. I am called Karai.